It's great to worship together with you today and with those online. We also had a nine o'clock service this morning too, and so able to create some more room and some more space for us as we regain more confidence to come out and to be able to worship together, and it's great. It, doesn't it feel good to have some sense of, of normalcy in our life and the rhythm and the, of worship and being able to be together? So it's great to be together with you, and again, uh, just to hi to all of you online. Glad to have you as well. Feel free to interact and engage. In the room, I can hear an amen, I can hear a yes, but online, I can't, so you'll have to just give a thumbs up or a heart or something like that. Well, um, we are in this series called Flip the Script, and where we're looking at the stories Jesus told. Jesus, uh, when he told stories, was very different than the way that many of the stories are told that we see today. Today, movies are the way that we consume a lot of our storytelling, isn't it? I mean, those are some of the greatest stories of our day we, we see on the big screen, and Lately, it's been more on our home screens, but we love these stories. And uh, during this uh, pandemic, one of the things our family ha has been enjoying is watching some of the Marvel movies together. Any of you guys Marvel fans? <laughs> Avengers, Guardians of the Galaxy, that kind of stuff. Well, we watched uh, Endgame last night. It's like a three-hour movie. I mean, a long movie, but if uh, Epic was ever to be given you know, a moniker for a movie, that would be it, right? It's, a, it's an epic movie. I mean, all of these, these superheroes together with their powers fighting evil to defend the world for good, and it just goes on and on, right? But it's a good movie, and it's, and it's a story that, that we see played out, and we, we even look in our own lives, and you know, how do we fight evil, and how do we fight good, and, and how can we be used in, in the places that we are put? And so we watch these movies, and, and they take, you know, they, they, so much goes into them, millions of dollars around the world, and then I contrast that, and I see these stories in, in the scriptures that we're looking at, Jesus' stories, and he can tell a story in like 30 seconds, 45 seconds, the parables that we're looking at, these, these powerful truths. It's like he strips away all of the other stuff and he gets right down to the point. He's saying, here's what I want you to understand. I'm, and I'm gonna tell you some stories because I want you to understand that there's a kingdom reality. So if you're not a follower of Christ, if you're kind of wondering, if you're curious about what it means to follow Jesus, his stories are a great way to gain some insight because he says there's a, a kingdom reality that is a kingdom of God that is not everyday life, flesh and bone, what we see here, but a reality that if our eyes are open to it, we will learn to live in a different way. And so he does that through telling stories. And there was a story that he told that, that I wanna look at today that he gathered with his disciples and, and they were having some questions about what are the end times gonna be like and, and Jesus was telling them, well, there's gonna be wars and famines and, and earthquakes and it's gonna be kind of a, a tough time, but you know what, I just want you to be ready. The main thing is don't worry so much about what's gonna happen. The main thing is that you are ready for my return. And then he said, let me tell you some stories. And he told a couple of different stories. One of the stories he told was this one. He said, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who went away on a long trip. And he called together his servants and he entrusted them with his money. He called them together one by one. And as he entrusted them, he gave the first servant, he said, come on in here. And he goes, here are five bags of silver. The story, when Jesus said it, he said talents. It was a, a large amount of money. Here are five bags of silver. He called on the second servant. He said, here are two bags of silver for you. And he called on the third servant and said, here's one bag of silver for you. And then he left on his trip. Well, no sooner was he gone, and the one with the five bags of silver said, you know, I gotta get about my master's business. I'm gonna invest this, what I have. And he doubled his return, and, and it grew to five more bags of silver. The second servant did the same thing, invested the money, began to work with it, and gained another two bags of silver. And the third one, well, he ended up burying the bag. He went out and dug a hole and he buried the bag of silver in the ground. Some time had passed, and the man that was on the trip came back and he called his servants in to give an account of what they had done with his money while he was gone. So the first servant came in, he said, look, master, you gave me five bags of silver to invest and I gained five more, here you go. And the master said, well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with just a small amount that I've given you. Come and share in your master's happiness. Let's celebrate together. The second servant comes in and he says, look, master, you gave me two bags of silver to invest. I've, I've doubled it. Here's two more. And the master says, well done, my good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with just a small amount. And now I will give you many more responsibilities. Come and share in my master's happiness. Let's celebrate together. Then the one with one bag of silver comes. He says, well, master, I, I knew you were a hard man, that you uh, harvested crops you didn't plant and you gathered crops you didn't cultivate, and so um, I just buried the money. 
and I want to play it safe, so here's your, here's your money back. Here's your one bag of silver. And the master said, you wicked and lazy servant. You wicked and lazy servant. If you knew I was a harsh man that, 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 that cultivated plants I didn't, you know, that gathered plants I didn't cultivate and, and harvest where I didn't plant, why didn't you at least invest the money in the bank where you could have gotten some interest for it? Now take this bag of silver from this one with one and give it to the one who has 10. He says, to those who use well what they've been given, they'll be given even more and they will have an abundance. But to those who do nothing with what they've been given, even what little they have will be taken away. Now take this useless servant and throw him out in the utter darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The end. Nice little bedtime story, right? I mean, these are, this is a story that Jesus tells us to understand what does it mean to be ready for his return and, and what do we do with that? What is our role in that and, and how do we understand this parable? And if you've been in the church for some time, this is a very familiar story. If you're newer to faith or just learning what it's about, you're gonna hear some things about what Jesus is looking at us, how he's looking at us and what we do in the meantime for his, before his return and how we handle what he's given us. Let's take some time to jump into this parable and uh, see what God might have to say to us today. Let's pray and just open our hearts for that. Heavenly Father, thank you for these stories that have stood the test of time and that when we dive into them, God, new things are brought out every time. And maybe today you need to challenge us in a certain way or you need to affirm us in a certain way. God, we open our hearts to hear what you have to say through these stories. We pray all these things in Jesus' name, amen. Amen, you guys ready to get into this? Are you sure? All right, online, you ready to go? All right, here we go. Point number one, Jesus entrusts us to carry out his mission until he returns. What we hear from the story is Jesus entrusts us to carry out his mission until he returns. Like he said, he said the story is like a kingdom, you know, like he says in verse 14, the kingdom of heaven, like a story of a man going on a long trip. He called his servants together and entrusted his money to them while he was gone. So we're looking at parables, which means the story parallels something else going on. Parable means to throw alongside. And so what's he throwing alongside this everyday story? He's letting us know there's a few things going on. The master is who? Jesus. Jesus is the master. And if Jesus is the master, who are the servants? We are the servants. And in that case where Jesus' listeners are around him are those who are his followers and his disciples. They understood we are his servants. And so when Jesus is trying to help them understand about being ready, he actually tells these stories, we read them in Matthew in chapter 25, well just a couple of chapters later, it's Holy Week, it's the end where Jesus is preparing for his death and resurrection and, and the terrible journey to the cross, that's about to happen, so this is taking place just before. And so he's trying to tell them, be ready because I'm gonna be gone in a little bit, right? So this story, the kingdom of heaven is like a master who goes away on a long trip. He's telling them, look, I'm gonna be gone for a long time, I'm leaving but I'm gonna be leaving and I'm gonna entrust you with something. I'm gonna trust you with my money. I'm gonna trust you with my resources that I want you to do something about. And so we have this context where, where Jesus wants his disciples to know, look, I want you to do something while I'm gone. There's a mission that I've begun, there's a journey that, that has started, and now it's time for you to be about that. Now imagine if they received this money and thought, well, the master's gonna be gone for a long time. This is a lot of money. Yeah, maybe I'll buy myself a new car. Maybe I'll build a new house. Maybe I'll go on some vacations. You know, I mean, he's giving me this stuff. I mean, he's not gonna be gone. He's not gonna be back for a while. Who knows if he'll ever come back. So let me just do with it what I want. No, they knew that he was, it was, they were entrusted with the master's money, and so they were to use that for the master's purpose. While in this story, Jesus doesn't lay out what that is, but through the rest of Jesus' teachings, we can learn a lot about the purpose of the master. And just a few chapters later in Matthew 28, after Jesus' death on the cross, after he rose from the grave and before he ascended, he called his disciples together and he told them actually very specifically what he wants from them while he's gone. And so maybe, some, I wonder if some of them thought, oh, is this what he's talking about? He's going on a long trip now and we gotta be about his business? Well, he said in Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20, the great commission. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commandments I have given you. Right, go, make disciples, be about that, and then baptize them. And that's what we're about to do here on Easter. That we see that as an important, essential part of our mission. 
to make disciples and to baptize you to say, you are now a follower of Christ. You've committed your life to him. Now let's tell everyone. And now we want to teach you what it means to follow him. That's what we do on Sundays and in our teachings and in our, in our groups and with kids and with students. This is the mission. This is the purpose. And so these, these servants understood this is the master's business that we need to be about. So here's the thing. Jesus entrusts us to carry out his mission until he returns. That's our responsibility. The second thing we see here in the parable, our kingdom responsibilities are in proportion to our abilities. Our kingdom responsibilities are in a proportion to our abilities. So right, like he called the servants in, he gave one five bags of silver, one two, and one person only got one. And then he says, he, was, he divided them in proportion to their abilities in, in verse 15. I think we sometimes struggle with this idea with the proportion of their abilities. Why does everyone not get the same thing? Why are people getting different abilities? And wait, let's, let's step back. He didn't, in, in the original language, he, ta- he said he gave them um, five talents, two talents, and one talent. Now, the word talent, we talked about this last week in the last parable, was actually a unit of measure. It was a weight. Some say between 80 and 130 pounds. It had changed a little bit over time. And so they would use that unit of weight to measure silver or gold. And so it's likely he entrusted them with you know, either silver or gold by that weight. 130 pounds of silver for one bag or 130 pounds of gold. That's a lot of money, isn't it? He entrusted them with that. Now, over, over time, the word talent, in large part because of this parable, has come to mean God-given abilities, God-given skills, something that he's blessed you with, right? So when we use that word talent, it's actually very fitting in the story. Because I don't think Jesus was literally just saying only about your money. This is, all, in the, you know, when the king returns, he only wants to know what you did with your money. That's a part of it. That's just an example here in the story. But talent really comes to mean so much more. What has God blessed you with? Not just natural skills or abilities or those that you have to develop as well, but your personality, who you are, where you were born, what generation you're in, the family that you come from, the experiences that you have, the work that you do, the life lessons that you've you've learned throughout your time, the financial capacity that you have, the, the influence that you have around you, the platforms, the position, whatever God has given you, the neighborhood he's put you in, all of those things could be considered what God blesses us and what God gives us to invest for his kingdom. So these are the talents that are given. But then it says in proportion to their abilities. Again, I think, do any of you ever kind of wonder about that or struggle about that? that, And you wonder, why didn't he just give them all even abilities? Well, I think the master had observed the servants. And just think about it as a good boss would do and even as a parent as you would do. You see who can handle responsibilities and who can't. Would you give more responsibilities to somebody who can't handle them? Answer that with me here. (laughs) No, right? Those who can handle responsibilities are often given more responsibilities. That's just the way it works in life, and Jesus recognized it, and he said here in life too, a lot of was given and, and, and expected. He observed the first servant, and maybe what he saw was somebody who was very capable, was doing things well and was able to multiply and work hard and say, all right, so this servant, I think you can do with five. Now, getting five talents was a greater responsibility. With greater responsibility comes, comes a greater weight as well of what you need to do with that. And then the second one, he said, oh man, you're able to do some great things. I've seen you work hard and I'm gonna trust you, you with two bags of silver. But then we come to this third servant. And I don't know, maybe you read this story, maybe you've heard it before and you kind of go, I guess he was the loser of the pack, right? He was the one who got picked last. Anyone ever think that? Anyone ever feel that? I mean, what did this guy, he only gets one? I mean, it's not really fair, these guys get five and get two, and, and he's left with one. I mean, how, how can that be all right? I mean, isn't God a God of fairness and of justice? But let's step back for a second. Was one talent something small? It wasn't. If, you, if I were to entrust you with $30,000 today, would you say that's a small trust that I placed in you? I mean, quite literally in money? No. So he obviously entrusted him even with a large sum of money. He believed in him. He believed that you have value. You have something to contribute. I believe that you can do this. And sometimes we have to grow in our responsibilities and our trust. And this was a great vote of confidence from the master to say, I'm entrusting you with one talent. Now, here's the thing. We we can look at one talent and kind of go, man, I, I wish I had more talents. But do you know that one talent people are some of the most successful people in the world? One talent people are also some of the most successful people in the universe. Again, I saw Guardians of the Galaxy and <laughs> Avengers and, I mean, Thor has one talent. He can harness lightning and has a big, you know, hammer. 
right? Or, you know, you've got intellect, or you've got strength, or you can fly, but what we see even in those movies is one talent can fully harnessed and leverage can create a great strength. But even in everyday life, one talent people, do you guys know who Garrett Cole is? Garrett Cole plays for the New York Yankees. Garrett Cole was just signed, uh, or last year he signed a nine-year deal worth $36 million a year. I wonder what he would do with all that money. $36 million. He's uh, one of the top two highest paid players in, uh, in baseball. That's a $342 million contract to play for the prestigious club of the New York Yankees. But you know what is just mind-blowing to me? The guy can't hit a ball. His batting average is 163. I mean, why would you get a contract for $340 million to play for such a famed club and you can't even hit a ball? It's because they hired him to pitch. He's a pitcher. <laughs> He's a pitcher. He's got one talent. He knows how to throw a ball fast and hard and straight. <laughs> That's his talent. And because of that talent, he's gone very far in that talent. Listen, you can do a lot for the kingdom of God with one talent fully invested. So let's not look at this third guy as someone who, you know, God doesn't trust, God doesn't give a lot to. No, you can do a lot with one talent fully invested in the kingdom of heaven. But you might even be sitting here going, that's great. I don't even have one talent. God didn't give me anything. I don't have any. I don't know what I could do. I don't know what God has given me. You need to step back and you need to take an inventory of your life. Remember what I said, it's not just about a natural skill or ability. Oh, I can't do this or can't do that. What has God blessed you and given you in your life? Where you're at, the people that you know, the experiences that you have. He's given us so much, but very specifically, the Bible says that if you are a follower of Christ, if you've given your life to Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes and gives you a gift, a spiritual gift, Scripture talks about. Look at 1 Corinthians 12, verse 7. A spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. God made sure that we are one body with many parts, that together each of us has a role to play and that you have an important part in the story. And so all of us are at least one talent people. And remember, we can do a lot with one talent. And then the king, uh, the, the master, after he gives out these talents, he just leaves. No further instructions, nothing else, just straight up, he, he leaves. There's one of the most powerful things you can do as a, as a boss or as a leader or as a parent in different ways. You just walk away, you leave. You tell somebody what they need to do and you step back. You know, as a parent, we leave the house sometimes and give our kids some different responsibilities, and then we go on a date and have fun while they have to clean the house, you know? All that, every, none of you guys do that? Isn't that why we have kids? They're not here in the service, so I can say that. No. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, by, by leaving, you're entrusting. You're saying, I have confidence that it's going to get done, and he does, and he leaves, and he leaves that to them. So then the, the third step here is time to get busy. And when the servant gives, uh, the master gives us the talents and the gifts, now he says, time to get busy. Do you risk it or do you bury it? Do you risk it? Do you invest it? Do you do something with it or do you bury it? Now we get to the, the crux of the story, right? And so in, in Matthew 25, 16 to 18, we just, again, we see there's five bags given of silver, two and one, and it says they went to work. The first two went to work and earned five more and earned two more. But the servant who received the one bag dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. The first two, they doubled their investment. They doubled. Anytime you double an investment, is that a good thing? If I were to say, give me your money, give me 100 bucks, I'm gonna double it. Would you do that? And I can guarantee, I don't know if I can guarantee, past performance is no indication of future returns. You're in finances, right? But I mean, if you double an investment, that's a great return on your investment. And that's what these first two did. They doubled it. And it got me thinking about, what does it mean to double our investment? What does it mean in the kingdom of God to double our investment? I mean, surely it's not just our finances that God is talking about, right? He's talking about how do we invest in others. In other places in Scripture, when Jesus talks about money and treasures, and we read in the Sermon on the Mount, he says, lay up treasures in heaven. So what it would look like for us to double our investment with what God has given us? He doesn't say. He lets us figure that out in, in this parable. But I wonder if one of those ways that we could look at it is, how, what would it look like for me to double the return on what God has invested in me? And then you put it together with the Great Commission. Go and make disciples. I wonder if he might be saying, every one of us, by the end of our life, if we double our investment, would have two more followers of Christ walking behind us. 
What if that was a mission that was given to you from this day on, if you're a follower of Christ, by the time you leave this world, when you stand for account before God one day, you would step up and say, look, here are two other followers of Jesus because of what has been done for me. Again, he's not saying that, it's not that specific, but do you see what I'm talking about? Replacing ourselves. God, you've given me one thing, now let's see, are there more that follow behind me? I'm gonna invest myself in such a way where that can happen. Or do we just bury again, bury what God has given us and just step back and say, I don't know, it's not my deal, it's not my business. What the church does and reaching people and making disciples, that's, the, that's why we hire pastors you know, to do that and we've got other people do that. I, I'm fine, let somebody else make disciples. God gives us in proportion to what he's been given us and then we have to invest it. We got, what are we gonna do with it? Do we risk it or do we invest it? Then the fourth part here is this though. One day, each of us will give an account of our lives before God. One day, each of us will give an account of our lives before God. Verse 19, it says, after a long time, the master returned from his trip and called them to give an account of how they had used his money. And really, our key question for today is, what have you done with what you've been given? I mean, if I were to summarize this whole thing, what have you done with what you've been given? And maybe say, what are you doing with what God has given you and is giving you right now? I mean, that's really at the, the crux of the question here is, we're gonna call, be called to give an account. And that question, I think, is what is implied here, is what has been asked. What did you do with what I've given you? Romans uh, 14, verses 10 and 12 says this. Remember, we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. Yes, each of us will give a personal account to God. How do you feel about that verse? One day, each of us is gonna stand before God and give an account of our life. That's what these, these, these servants had to do. All right, what'd you do with what I gave you? How'd you live your life? What, what was that all about? Now, some of us might think this is a really scary thought to stand before God and give an account of our life. And there should be a healthy amount of respect and fear to say, you know, I wanna make sure that it was good and I did, did well, but does it have to be scary? Think about it in everyday life. If your boss calls you in for your annual review, which is basically giving an account for what you've done, or maybe it's a quarterly review or whatever, do you have to dread that meeting? I can tell you one thing, I know who, who, I know who dreads that meeting. Those who didn't do anything, right? If you had a good sales return, if you did what was asked of you, if you went above and beyond what was there, you don't have to dread that meeting. You can't wait to get in that meeting because you're thinking, I can't wait to share what I've done. Here's what I did for the company. Here's what I did. You know, I took this new initiative and I worked hard and you asked me to do this. I did this and I did this. But if you come in and say, you know what, I, I just didn't even know where to begin and, and I was so busy and you start making excuses, you might dread that. But I look at the kingdom of God and we have to give an account. We can say, with joy, we can step into God's presence one day and say, Lord, I did what I could. I gave it my best. I worked, I worked hard for it. We're going to each have to give an account for what we've done. And these three servants come back and they give an account. I gained five, I gained two, and one, I didn't gain anything. Which leads us to number five. Our reward is not based on what we've been given, but on what we've done with what we've been given. There's a key distinction there. Our reward is not based on what we've been given, but what have we done with what we've been given? So you look at these first two servants, they come back. And it's interesting, the response for the first servant, right? He says, the master was full of praise. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount. Now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Notice that he didn't say, you know, well done, my successful servant, my brilliant servant my smart servant. What did he commend the servant on? His faithfulness. Another way that word could be translated is a trustworthiness. That I've given you something, you've been faithful with what you've been given, you've been trustworthy, you've engaged it, you've leveraged it. You see, we focus on how much God has given us or how little, but God wants to know what do you do with it? And I think it's interesting, the second servant comes in, and now in our, in our Western culture, in our capitalistic culture, we would expect a different response for the second servant, wouldn't we? No? Am I the only one that if you just kind of heard that story? Well, if the first one got this commendation, he did the most, right? The first one did the most, right? I mean, financially speaking, he gained five more bags. That's three more bags than the, than the second servant did. 
And so if I'm the second servant coming in going, oh, I don't feel so good about maybe what I've done. I mean, I, you know, I gained two more. My buddy over here got five more bags and I'm like three short of that. I mean, he got this great commendation and he's gonna be with the master that night. He's gonna hang out and have a party and he's gonna give him more responsibilities. I hope I get something. Master, I, I got you two more bags of silver. Imagine his surprise, the exact same response. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with just the little that I've given you. I'm gonna put your, give you way more responsibilities and put you in charge of more things and, and now come, let's celebrate, let's have a party tonight. I think that's such a powerful part of Jesus' storytelling here when he tells us about the kingdom. It didn't matter what the initial giving was, was it? What, we, what he was given with talents. What mattered was what they did with it and the response was just the same. And I think what that teaches us, we don't have to live in the comparison trap. I don't have to live in the comparison trap of saying, Pastor so-and-so has this kind of church and this kind of resources, but at least I have more than this guy, and you don't have to worry about that with your talents, with somebody else, and, and, and God's not gonna care about how you compare with somebody else. He's gonna care about what you've done with what you've been given, and we can share in an equal reward when we work hard and we invest with what God has given us. Well, then we come to the, man, you know, the servant with the, third, uh, with the one bag of silver. Let me just ask you this question. What do you think the master's response would have been had he invested the silver and got another bag of silver? What do you think the response would have been? <laughs> yeah. I mean, imagine he came in, was kind of worried, I only got one bag of silver, I mean, compared to the others, and to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant, you had one talent, and you took that one talent, and you invested it, you doubled it, way to go, come join me at the party with the one with the five and the two, we're all in this together. But that didn't happen, did it? The response was pretty harsh from the master. You wicked and lazy servant. I would have trouble writing this in a message and teaching that on a Sunday if I didn't have the story and just being like, you know what happens if you don't invest what God's given you? He's gonna call you wicked and lazy. I mean, it feels harsh. But hey, I'm just preaching the word of God. <laughs> Faithful to the word of God. I mean, that's what he's saying. If you don't invest, if you don't do with what God has given you, he's gonna call you wicked and lazy. And, and the judgment isn't really for doing wrong because we could kind of say, at least he didn't lose it, right? I mean, at least he preserved it. But it seems to say that the master is saying it's not enough just to preserve it. I'm gonna hold you responsible for what you do with it. Are you doing good with it? And then even this, this common sense response would say, well, why didn't you at least just put it in the bank where it could have gotten some interest, right? I mean, any of us know that in finances, as you understand, if it's money's just sitting there on your counter, it's not doing anything. It's just actually losing value. It's depreciating over time because of inflation and other things, Right? So he's saying even common sense, invest it. And I was thinking, what, is that, what would that equivalent look like in a parable? And not everything in a parable necessarily means that we have to have, have it all figured out, but I wonder what would the interest be? And the one thing I thought about is saying, hey, if you've got a lot of money and you're not willing to do anything, at least give it to the church or give it to a nonprofit who's gonna do something with it instead of it just collecting and, you know, and, and doing the other purposes. At least invest it somewhere where Good is gonna come out of that and life is, is gonna change. And so he's looking at him, he's saying, why did you bury it? He's looking for a return on investment. <laughs> but I wonder if another way to look at that burying is just the wasted opportunity on all those years where a return could have been netted, right? Even just in the bank, interest over time, we know it can gain some money. Not right now, because interest rates are terrible, but um, in the bank. So, but he might look in practical terms and say, you know, all these years, I mean, all these years of wasted opportunity. You've been at your job for how long now? And you never at once just even talked about your faith or your relationship with God or even let somebody know, maybe invite them to church or share a resource with them. All these years, all these years you were at school with your classmates and never once did you open your mouth or, or just talk about what God's doing in your life. All these years you've been on that sports team or you've been in that club or you've been in that book club or this group of friends. All these years of wasted opportunity. All these years you've been in the church for how long? Your whole life? And you just come and you just attend and you sit in church on Sunday. I mean, that's great. That's a, a participation. But, but what more could you be doing with what God has given you? You mean you've never learned to tithe? How many years? You've never learned to put God first in your finances. Years of wasted opportunity that could be used to leverage for the kingdom what God has given you. This is what God is holding the servant to account for this master. He's saying, don't play it safe. Invest it. Risk it. Do something with it that multiplies it. 
I bet you even if these servants would have invested some of that money and would have lost some of it, they said, I tried whatever I could. We did this thing to try to reach people in the community. We tried to, we tried to take some, some steps of, of courage and they didn't work out, but God, we gave it everything. Remember what the commendation was for, was for being faithful, being trustworthy, for going after it. Don't bury it, don't play it safe. And the consequences for this poor guy were take the money from this servant and give it to the one with the 10 bags of silver. And then in verse 30, now throw this useless servant into outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus told stories like this because he wants us to know he's serious about what we do as followers of Christ. It matters to him. And it's important because in the end, when the servant doesn't do what he's been entrusted to do and gifted to do and using the spiritual gift, what he's been given, in the end, what he's saying is the purposes of the kingdom didn't matter to him. It didn't matter to be about the father's business, and so he just buried it, and in the end, he ended up losing ground. And where the first two servants are, set, are told, come and let's celebrate together, that's about relationship. It's basically Jesus saying, come, let's spend time together. You obviously cared about the things of the kingdom and what mattered most to me, but this third one, throw him out. Cast him out. This is a judgment in the end times. If you don't want to have relationship with Jesus, if you don't want to be about the things of his kingdom in this earth now, why would you want to be in eternity with him anyway? And so he's saying there's not going to be relationship with me in this way. But he doesn't tell us this parable to try to scare us or to try to, you know, avoid that. He wants us to share in the master's happiness, to celebrate, to hear those words. And then he gives us overall kingdom principle, which is relevant today as at any time, in Matthew 25, 29, to those who use well what they are given, even more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who do nothing, even what little they have will be taken away. I think we want an abundance. I, I think every one of us wants to hear, even in this world, for, uh, whether a child to a parent or a, an employee to an employer or, or when tasked with something, we want to hear, well done. You did what I asked. You went above and beyond. Man, that's awesome. Well done. I'm going to give you more responsibilities. There's a part of us that wants to be used, that wants to be engaged, and Jesus is saying, yes, be a part of what I'm doing. I want you to have this abundance. So it comes back to us. What do we do with this story? What do you do with it? And it comes back to this question just phrased a little differently that we asked earlier. Are you multiplying or burying what God has entrusted you with? Are you multiplying it or are you burying it? God's given you talents. He's blessed you with resources, with money, with your voice, your mind, courage, your personality, spiritual gifts. Because even in, uh, in Romans chapter 12 where we read about the spiritual gifts, it doesn't just list the gifts and say, here's some of the gifts. It says, take those gifts and now do good with them. Take them to another level. Do well with them. If you have the gift of leadership, lead well. If you have the gift of hospitality, take others into your home. Leverage that gift. Use that gift. Multiply that gift. And the way we do that is Jesus saying to us, he doesn't want us to, to play it safe. He wants us to take some risks. Are you willing to take some risks? Are you willing to step out of your comfort zone? Are you willing to, to, to leverage some more time and energy? It was a couple of uh, months ago, I was uh, teaching one of the messages here. I don't remember what Sunday it was in particular or what the message was. But even as I was teaching, it wasn't in my notes. It just connected somehow, and I pointed over to our empty uh, drum um, enclosure over there and said, you know, by the way, and if you, if you know how to play drums, let us know because we, we could really use a drummer. And uh, I just kind of threw that out there and was talking about some other stuff. Well, after the service, a gentleman was hanging around a little bit and wanted to talk to me, and he said, you know, you talked about um, not having a drummer. Well, um, I play drums, and um, I haven't played in 10 years, uh, but, uh, but I'd, you know, I'd be open to, to playing if you want to hear and give me a shot. And uh, it was like, wow. <laughs> I mean, what are the odds? That day I just said that, he was sitting there, and he saw it, and he heard it, and, but he took a step to say, you know, Kyle stepped out. Kyle, who's been playing drums, hasn't it been awesome to add Kyle to our, our team? And, uh, and just using that gift, and, and we got a chance to hear him, and, and he's just been working on it. He bought another drum kit, and he's practicing and getting, you know, I don't think he's got any rust in, in him anymore. I think he's definitely worked that out. And, uh, and we we're blessed by it. We're blessed by it each and every week, somebody who stepped out and took a chance. So I just want to challenge you, are you investing your gifts? And do you want to invest your gifts into Team MPC? 
Team MPC. <laughs> now, again, all of our gifts aren't meant to just be used in, in roles in the church. They're used in, in our everyday lives and what we do in our work world and our families, but there's the calling that we have as a church. And it's not just using gifts inside the church versus out in the world. Everything we do inside, quote unquote, the church is for the world. If you're hugging children, it's not just, oh, you, you, know, you watch children or you help children, you teach children from Meadow Park. No, what we offer every Sunday morning in Park Kids is for any person in this community to come and have their children learn about Jesus Christ. And this is what we offer here. It's not just a church thing, it's a mission thing. And when we are invited to be a part of this community, to be a part of Team Meadow Park, how are you a part of what God is doing? Maybe you need to be part of the Connections team. You come to church already anyway, just come a little bit earlier and put a smile on, greet some folks, let them in, welcome them. Now, if you're a grouchy person, this might not be the team for you. Or maybe you avoid the nine o'clock service, we get up a little bit more, you know. But if, if your demeanor is, I like meeting people, I just like making them feel well, I like hosting, and I like creating an environment that's welcoming. Yeah, I can get out there with an umbrella and let people in in the rain, or I can do that. Yeah, absolutely, connections, connect, helping people, following up with, with, with new folks. I look at our tech and our productions. I mean, technology is so much a part of our life today, and it's a great tool that God has given us to be able to share the good news of Jesus. Well, maybe you have some skills or want to develop those skills, and we can train you how to, how to you know, you do the lights and the sound and to run a camera and to run our online stuff. It's so technical, and, and we want those who would love to do that to get involved, and we'd love to teach you how to do that. Operate a camera. Take some pictures. Be a part of our communications team. Maybe you like social media. You can have an eye for design and graphics. You can be involved with that. Let us know. Leverage those gifts in the kingdom. We need small group leaders, D-team leaders, those that are gonna say, you know, I wanna care for a part of the congregation. Give me five to 10 to 15 people that, that I can just help guide in, in some conversation, discussion, and prayer, and we can care for one another. I wanna just facilitate those groups with students or with adults. I wanna pour into that. I mentioned park kids. Maybe just give some time. Say the next generation. I want to help those kids. I want to be a part of that. I want to be a kid and come in on a Sunday morning and have a great time with these kids. That they come to church and they give me a hug and they know that, well, you know, who, who I am and, and I'm investing them. I'm pouring into them. Maybe you want to be part of our outreach team. Plan live love events and live love days and activities and, and, and connect with our local partners and say, how can we help mobilize our church to engage in the community and the partners that we have? You say, I want to be a part of that. Maybe you're saying, ah, I'm just a little bit more of a behind the scenes person or just give me a tool in my hand or give me some, you know, put a shovel and I'll, I'm good. Well, be a part of the facilities team or the grounds team and help, help paint some hallways that we want to paint. Help uh, cut the grass, help repair something. Make the, you know, do some gardening. We need people who can plant flowers and trim bushes and trees and make this place look beautiful and look awesome. And that's a way that you're contributing to what we're doing in the kingdom. And maybe you look up here and you go, well, we've got, seems like we've got everything covered, you know, singers and musicians. Well, we have a thing called a rotation. And we can use more people, and, and, and there's a high demand and different services in different weeks, and we could use multiple drummers and guitarists and singers and, and keyboardists. Use your gifts, leverage them, get involved with what God is doing. Rick Warren, I love this, I just read it this week in a devotional I had, he said this, God uses people who expect him to act, who never give up, who take risks in faith, who get his dream and go after it, it's your choice whether you want to be the kind of person God uses to accomplish his purposes. I mean, we want to be a part of that. And I want to invite you to be a part of that together as a church in what we're doing. Because one day I hope that we can stand before God, each of us individually, and we can hear those words, well done, my good and faithful servant. Ed, well done. Rick and Jen, well done, my good and faithful servant. Gary, Lisa, Morgan, Courtney, well done. Sandy, well done, my good and faithful servant. Phyllis, Andy, if you're watching online, well done, good and faithful servants. Well done. Well done, my good and faithful servants. You've used well what God has given you. And I want to hear as a church where he says, Meadow Park, what have you done with what I've given you? In this time, in the year 2021, as the pandemic is, is kind of in this transition period and, and the world is in this position, and what are you doing as a church? to use well what you've been given and to invest that in the kingdom. I wanna stand before God and one day say, God, with what you've given us at Meadow Park Church, we have invested, you've given us this, and here we have doubled it. We've grown, we've continued to reach people, 
for, for your kingdom. And heaven is fuller because of what we have done together. God's inviting us to be a part of that. And he's saying, let's celebrate. Come, let's be in relationship together and be about this mission that God has given us. Let's stand together as we close in prayer. Heavenly Father, this is such a, I hope an encouraging story. Just reminding us we get the joy of being a part of being used by you, that, that we don't just have to go through this world wondering what our purpose is and, and what we're supposed to do, but God, that you've created us, you've given us gifts and responsibilities to say, use these, change people's lives. I'm with you every day. Go, make disciples, teach them what it means to be free from their sin and to be renewed. God wants to use us to restore marriages and to teach children to know you and for students to, to navigate this important time in their lives and for young families to know what it means to, to follow you. God, for a community to be transformed because of our presence. God, for missions around the world as we partner with others, we get to be a part of that. Father, help us to do well with what you've given us. Thank you that you have entrusted us. And Father, thank you that your promises will prevail and that we get to be a part of what you're doing in this world, bringing light and bringing hope. We pray all these things in Jesus' name and we commit ourselves to you. Amen.